In London, in the summer of 1858, there was something rotten in the air. A terrible smell was terrorizing the largest and wealthiest city on earth. It was the mighty and majestic River Thames that was causing a stink, the Great Stink. But where did it come from? And how did the Londoners solve the Great Stink? Watch until the end of the video to find out what we still can see today from the solution they came up with in 1858. Welcome to History Uncovered. Don't forget to subscribe. During the summer of 1858, London's famous River Thames was causing a big problem, it smelled like rotting eggs. The smell wasn't the only problem, but it was actually considered a public health menace. Because the smell was so intense, it was all everyone could talk about. Writers, newspapers, poets and even politicians were talking about it. Chancellor of the Exchequer Benjamin Disraeli famously referred to the river, in Parliament on 15 July 1858, as a Stygian pool, reeking with ineffable and intolerable horrors. A surgeon of the time described the appearance of the river as black as ink, and in his 1857 novel, Little Dorrit, Charles Dickens referred to the Thames as a deadly sewer. The Illustrated London News of July 1858 published a piece on the great question of the pollution of the Thames and demanded something be done about it. The article went on to describe the river as a foul sewer, a river of pollution, a stream of death, festering and reeking with all abominable smells, and threatening three million people with pestilence. On 16 June 1858, temperatures reached 35 degrees Celsius in London. It was the start of a long period of dry and hot weather with temperatures over 30 degrees Celsius, which we nowadays call a heatwave. An American who was visiting London at the same time wrote that it had been hotter than anyone ever believed it possible to be in England. Even Queen Victoria complained about the spifling heat of June in her diary. In the courts of Westminster Hall, lawyers were granted the rare freedom to remove their wigs. All of this created the perfect circumstances for the Thames to become a big smelly problem. The conditions made the Thames sit lower than usual, revealing the solid and semi-solid masses of waste on the shores of the river, where it would sit and stew under the roasting sun. The smell was even so bad, that some people who got too close to the Thames, suffered from apoplectic fits, fainting, and vomiting. The power of the noxious stench from the river was unbelievable. Dock workers were seen throwing up and a woman who threw herself into the river in a suicide attempt survived, but was knocked unconscious by the foul fumes multiple times. The smell from the river got so bad that the House of Parliament had to be soaked in chloride of lime to allow people to tolerate working inside. The Library of the Lords was described as a stench trap, and Goldsworthy Gurney, the engineer responsible for the ventilation of the new Palace of Westminster, declared to the Speaker that he could no longer be responsible for the health of the House. At one point, Disraeli had to flee a committee room in the middle of a session, pressing a handkerchief to his face, stumbling away bent over, followed by everyone else gagging and retching. As they couldn't do their jobs anymore because of the smell, the Prime Minister and Lords became keen on doing something about the great stink at this point. On 15 July 1858, Disraeli put the appropriate legislation before Parliament and by 2 August it was law. It was one of the quickest laws to be made in history. In early July 1858, over 200 tons of lime were dropped into the Thames, near the mouths of the sewers in an effort to take the horrendous smell away. This liming process, was done regularly during 1858 and 1859. It was an attempt to break down and disinfect the horrendous smell from the water. The substances that was used, included chalk lime, chloride of lime, and carbolic acid. This was reported to cost £180 a day, which would be about £10,000 today. But how did the problem arise in the first place? Well, the Metropolitan Sewers Act of 1848 took sewage from London properties and dumped it in the Thames. Before this, there were around 200,000 cesspools in homes and businesses in the city. The cesspools were meant to be emptied by Knight's oilmen who took the excrement away in carts and sold it as fertilizer. However, this system was incredibly patchy and most of these cesspools remained stagnant. The new sewers of 1848 made the Thames into one great cesspool instead of each person having one of his own, as the architect Thomas Cubitt observed. The problem was that Londoners were taking this same water from the river back into their homes and businesses, half a billion litres a day, to wash with, use in their newfangled flushing toilets, and even to drink. That's disgusting, right? The great stink made the Palace of Westminster an unbearable place to work and was nearly moved out of London. MP John Brady told the House of Commons that it was impractical to continue working in the Thames side building, 
urging the government to ask the Queen for permission to move the business of Westminster to a temporary location outside London. Brady wasn't the only one to suggest this plan. Some of the places floated as interim homes included Oxford, Edinburgh, and Dublin. Untreated human sewage is bad enough, but this was just a small part of the great toxic mix that was the Thames of 1858. The river also contained waste from livestock, the refuse from homes, businesses, hospitals, schools, and prisons, and chemical and organic waste from soapworks, tanneries, factories, slaughterhouses, and mills. Refuse from gasworks, breweries, gut spinners, fish markets, tar works, bone grinders, and butchers also oozed and festered in the capital's famous waterway. Death, among animals and humans, was everywhere in Victorian London, and it was all too common to see carcasses of cows, dogs, cats, rats, horses, and people floating in the water or beached on the shores. In the summer of 1858 the government gave green light to take action, and engineering genius Sir Joseph Bazalgette could start work on his ambitious new drainage system for London. He started in 1859 and was finished in 1875. Finally, by 1887, the dumping of sewage into the Thames had stopped completely. Bazalgette and his team built 85 miles of intercepting sewers that ran alongside the Thames, as well as an additional 1,100 miles of Main Street sewers. His great engineering turned the Thames from the dirtiest city waterway in the world to the cleanest, and his sewers still form the basis of London's sewage system today. Bazalgette's plan for London didn't just involve improving drainage but also saw the construction of the Thames embankments we know and love today, which contain sewers and tube tunnels, as well as new thoroughfares such as Shaftesbury Avenue and Charing Cross Road. If you enjoyed watching this video, please support our channel by subscribing and liking this video.